Uh, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, specific session of optimization of antiretroviral therapy that I'm co-sharing with um, Dr. Gandhi. And um, it's a pleasure to have uh, three great speakers on this session. And um, we'll start with the first speaker, which is um, Professor Jean-Michel Molina. Jean-Michel, I think that I don't need to, to present who you are, but uh, he's a professor of sexual disease at uh, the University of Paris Diderot Paris Set. It would be better for me to present Jean-Michel in French, and you will learn French. You need to learn French and to understand French. So I will do it in French. <laughs> so if you don't understand French, please. You may, I apologize, but I will do it in French for Jean-Michel only. Jean-Michel is a professor of maladies infectious. Do you understand what is professor in English? <laughs> okay. You have to wake up, all of you, because you just after lunch. Um, professor of maladies infectious at the University of Paris du Dro, and the chef of the Department of maladies infectious at l'hôpital Saint-Louis. Chef in French, in English, is head of. So we have another French lesson today. So Jean-Michel, tu as le micro. Merci Serge. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. So it's a pleasure today to share with you the first results of the Emerald study on behalf of the study group. DCF-TAF is the first once daily STR that contains the Runevir. You know that boosted the Runevir is a drug that has a high and durable uh, if antiviral efficacy. It also has a high barrier to the development of resistance, and it's a unique characteristics of uh, boosted, uh, boosted uh, the runavir. It is also recommended uh, in EACS and DHHS guidelines for first-line treatment. TAF, as you know, is a prodrug of tenofovir with a similar efficacy, but with an improved renal and bone safety profile. So in DCF-TAF, you have combined a single pill, 800 mg of darunavir, 150 mg of cobicistat, 200 mg of emtricitabine, and 10 mg of TAF. This uh, single pill is being investigated today in two ongoing large phase three trials, both in treatment-naive patients, the AMBER study, and in treatment experienced patients, the Emerald study. And I'm going to share with you today the interim results of the Emerald study. These slides outlines the study design. Emerald is an open-label, randomized, multi-center, non-inferiority, fast free trial among well-suppressed HIV-infected individuals on a boosted PI-based regimen with TDF and FTC. These um, individuals were randomized two to one to either switch to DCF-TAF one pill a day or to uh, continue their boosted PI-based regimen with TDF-FTC for 48 weeks. And the data I'm going to show you today are the data at week 24, the interim safety and efficacy analysis. The objective of the study is to uh, show non-inferiority of DCF-TAF versus continuing the boosted PI-based regimen uh, in patients who had a viral load suppressed below 50 copies per ml for the last two months Patients might be uh, eligible if they had a prior history of virologic failure, but no virologic failure on the renovir and no uh, the renovir resistance mutations. At baseline, the creatine clearance had to be above 50 ml per minute. The primary study endpoint uh, is the proportion of patients with virologic rebound, and it is the cumulative proportion through week 48. Virologic rebound is defined in the study as a confirmed viral load above 50 copies per ml or a single viral load above 50 uh, in uh, patients uh, who would discontinue a study drug afterwards. The statistical analysis uh, looks at non-inferiority and the margin for non-inferiority has been set at 4% at week uh, 48 according to the, w, the FDA uh, guidance. So this slide shows you the baseline demographics uh, of the patients. And remember that 
it's a randomization two to one, so you have twice more patients in the DCF TAF as in the control arm. So the median age was 46 to 45 years. Uh, most individuals were male and white. The median CD4 cell count at baseline was above 600. And the median time since diagnosis was on average nine years. 40% uh, of the uh, participants were on their first ARV regimen and 15% on average had experienced prior biologic failure. In terms of the boosted PI at screening, you could see that the majority of patients were uh, already on a Dorinavir-based regimen, 21% on an Atezenavir-based regimen, and uh, less than 8% on Lopinavir. 14 to 17% were already receiving cobicistat, and the mean EGFR was uh, uh, above 100 uh, ml per minute. If we look at uh, week 24 efficacy, looking at the rate of virologic uh, failure, you could see that uh, 14 individuals, 1.8% in the DCF TAF, experienced a confirmed virologic rebound through week 24. Eight in the control arm with a similar proportion, 2.8%. When you look at the uh, difference in these two proportions, it was minus 0.3, and you could see that the confidence interval uh, lines um, uh, below 4%. However, most rebounders uh, through week 24 were actually patients who were suppressed uh, during um, uh, the next uh, couple of weeks under the same treatment regimen. There were no confirmed rebounds above 200 copies per ml, no discontinuation for virologic failures, and the few participants who have been genotyped, two in the uh, DCF TAF arm and two in the control arm, there were no emergence of uh, NRTI or PI resistance mutations. So if we look at the uh, efficacy results at week 24 using the usual FDA snapshot analysis, you could see that the rate of allergic success was very high in both arms, above 85%. And the uh, number of patients with virologic failure at week 24 was actually much lower than the number of patients who had a cumulative virologic rebound through week 24, since only four individuals in the DCF tough arm and three in the control arm experienced uh, or had a viral load above 50 copies per ml at week 24. Let's look now at the safety uh, through week 24. First, uh, uh, clinical adverse events. As you can see on these slides, um, the rate of grade three to four adverse events related to study drugs was very small, 1.2% in the DCF TAF arm, less than 1% in the control arm. And if we look at the total uh, number of uh, individuals who discontinued uh, treatment during these first uh, 24 weeks of the study, you could see that it was below 3% in both arms. And in particular, if we look at the adverse event that led to treatment discontinuation, it was in the range of 1% in both arms. So both regimen were actually uh, very well tolerated. Interestingly, if we looked at the discontinuation due to renal adverse events, only one individual in the DCF tough arm and two in the control arm discontinue uh, their study drugs because of a renal adverse event. And indeed, the most common adverse events reported during these first 24 weeks were mainly nasopharyngitis, upper respiratory tract infection, and vitamin D deficiencies. When we look at grade three or four lab abnormalities three week 24, you could see that uh, three to four percent of the uh, participants had a creatine clearance uh, which dropped below 60 ml per minute. There were more uh, patients uh, having an LDL cholesterol above uh, 4.9 millimolar per liter in the DCF tough arm as compared to the control arm. But uh, at the bottom of the slide, you can uh, see that when we looked at the total cholesterol to HDL cholesterol ratio and the change from baseline to week 24, there was actually no difference uh, between uh, the two arms. There were fewer individuals who experienced a low phosphatemia uh, in the DCF tough arm as compared to the control arm and uh, more patients with a high bilirubin level in the control arm, but this was due to uh, individuals who were receiving a boosted tezanavir-based regimen. Because it was uh, unexpected maybe to see uh, 
a similar number of people having a low creatine clearance with DCF-TAF as compared to the control arm with uh, TDF-FTC. Uh, we uh, looked at the uh, changes in EGFR through week 24 using uh, both serum creatinine on the left-hand side and cystatin C on the right-hand side. And what you can see when you look at the estimated GFR based on serum creatinine on the left-hand side was that in both arms you have a small decline uh, from baseline in uh, EGFR and the decline appears to be even a little bit uh, uh, higher with uh, DCF-TAF. On the right-hand side, uh, however, when you uh, estimate GFR based not on serum creatinine but on cystatin C using serum cystatin C, you could see that on the other hand, this time you have with DCF-TAF a small uh, but significant increase from baseline in EGFR and at week 24 there was a significant difference in favor of DCF-TAF um, regarding this uh, measure. And this is consistent with what we know about cobicistat, and cobicistat actually um, can inhibit the tubular secretion of creatinine, increasing plasma level of creatinine, and therefore impacting EGFR when you um, use EGFR based on serum creatinine, but has no impact on the real EGFR, and in particular if you use cystatin C to measure glomerular filtration. Looking at bone mineral density changes from baseline to week 24, you could see on this slide what you may have expected uh, comparing a TAF-based regimen to a TDF-based regimen with uh, an increase, although uh, small but significant as compared to the control arm in bone mineral density at the hip and spine level favoring the DCF-TAF arm. And indeed, uh, if you look at the bottom of the slide, you could see that with DCF-TAF, for example, at the spine level, 24% of the individuals had an increase of both 3% as compared to only 9% with the control arm. So in summary, uh, these data from the 24-week uh, interim analysis of EMERAL, looking at the safety and the efficacy, um, these data show you that through week 24, switching from a boosted PI plus TDF-FTC to the single P regimen of DCF-TAF, resulted in a similar low virologic rebound rate, uh, a high virologic suppression rate, there were no discontinuation for virologic failure, no resistance to any study drug, although the number of patients tested was limited, and few uh, serious adverse events and discontinuation due to adverse events in both arms. Also, uh, the dcf TAF bone, renal and lipid safety versus control were consistent with the known profile of TAF and cobicistat. So in summary, the single peel DSF-TAF combines both the safety advantages of TAF and the Renovir and the known efficacy uh, and high genetic barrier to resistance of the Renovir. With that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people who participate to this trial, the Emerald study team, and the principal investigators uh, in Canada, the US, and across Europe who uh, were involved in this trial. Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you, Jean. Uh, it's working. Thank you, Jean Michel. I think that we have time for two questions. Uh, you have mic on. I'll start us off. I just wanted to ask you, Dr. Molina, if this was going to be approved for um, only creatinine clearance. Uh, Mike. Is this, <laughs> is this only going to be approved for creatinine clearance greater than? 50, I know that um, patients were only enrolled if they had a credit current greater than 50, and why that was chosen over 30. Uh, I'm, I couldn't hear the question well enough. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. If you could speak the up. The question was the EGFR of oh. greater than 50. And um, will this be uh, you know, a drug that's the, approved only greater than 50? Right. So the drug is not yet approved. Um, the, in this trial, actually, the credit occurrence at baseline was set at above 50 because in the control arm, there was TDF-FTC. Um, so uh, we have to wait and see whether in the uh, approval, when the drug is going to be approved, what would be, wh wh where was, uh, there would be any restriction on EGFR. Yes, please. Uh, Francois Raffi from France. Thank, thank you, Jean-Michel, for this nice uh, presentation. I have a comment with regards to lipid changes. You say that the safety 
uh, for lipids was, as expected, based on TAF and COBE. Uh, but actually, uh, you only showed that more patients had grade 3 or LDL elevation in uh, more patients in the switch arm. Uh, so uh, based on the fact that uh, patients on PI, when they are aging, we try to avoid these uh, lipid abnormalities. Uh, can you comment on uh, to, our, to what extent these patients had elevations in LDL and how many uh, did have to start uh, lipid lowering agents during the study? Okay, thank you, Francois, for this question. I think, yes, I mentioned that, and we know that from previous studies that we have uh, TAF as compared to TDF, you, you may see an increase in LDL cholesterol, but I mentioned also that in the study, when you look at the ratio of total cholesterol to HDL, there was no change, and you, know, uh, you could argue whether you know, one parameter is better predictive of cardiovascular disease as, as the other. So I don't have, on the top of my mind, the exact number of people who used statins, but, but again, here it's, uh, with this regimen, a way to simplify and to uh, improve the safety of the boosted PI-based regimen, and, uh, and we know that boosted PI have unique uh, properties in terms of very high genetic barrier to resistance, and this is uh, unmatched so far in, with other drug classes. Thank you, Jean-Michel. This, this is a very good transition to, to, to welcome the next presenter. His presentation is related to a switch regimen also in a patient age above 50 years and um, cardiovascular risk. Uh, the next presenter is um, Jose Gattel. He's a senior consultant at the Infectious Disease Unit of Hospital Clinic, professor of medicine at the University of Barcelona in Spain. Jose, you have a floor. Good, good, good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction and to organizers for selecting this, uh, this study for, for this afternoon session. This is an, uh, an a switching study from a boosted protease inhibitor to dolutegravir, but targeting a very specific population of patients, that is patients with high cardiovascular risk, as defined by a Framingham score above 10% or an age above uh, 50 years. Uh, this is the NEED 022 study, and I'm going to present it on behalf of the, all the co-authors and the investigators, and let me mention specifically Lambert Asomu, that is the statistician of the study, and Anton Potniak, that is the, 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 the chair of the NEED uh, ID network. Uh, the study was, uh, an was an independent investigator initiative study and it was funded by Viva Healthcare and this is my conflicts of interest. And essentially the, the hypothesis uh, for the study was that by switching a boosted protease inhibitor to a dolutegravir regime in a targeted population with high cardiovascular risk, plasma lipid profile will improve and cardiovascular risk may decrease while virological suppression will be maintained and the tolerance will not be compromised. And so with this hypothesis in mind, we designed this study. This is an European study, six countries, uh, 32 sites in Europe. It is a prospect randomized, uh, the randomization was one to one, and the patients were randomized either to continue the boosted PI plus two nucleosides regime or to a switch to dolutegravir while maintaining the backbone uh, nucleosides. Patients that were included in the study were patients that were virologically suppressed for at least six months on a triple therapy with a boosted PI, with an age above 50 or a Framingham score above 10% and with no documented resistance mutations to the, to the, to, to, to the, to the study drugs. What I'm going to report is the, first, is the final results the, or the primary endpoint of the study. It is what we call the immediate switching at the... Uh, uh, the patients, all the patients have been completed a 48-week follow-up that is the primary endpoint of the study. Uh, later on, at, at week 48, the patients who were initially randomized to continue a boosted PI, they will be switched to the lutegravir and the, it will be another year follow-up and this data will be presented hopefully at the Amsterdam conference. 
The, there was two co-primary endpoints. One is the, is the proportion of patients free of therapeutic failure at 48 weeks. And the, the second one is the percent change in fasting total cholesterol at uh, 48 weeks. The study was powered for the first uh, co-primary endpoint because it was the, the one that required uh, more patients. In addition of that, it's going to be some super studies using inflammatory immune activation biomarkers, carotid intima media thickness, arterial stiffness, that has been submitted to the ACTS meeting uh, in, uh, next, in next October. So the, the sample size was calculated of uh, 220 patients with, uh, uh, it was a non-inferiority trial and the margin, the, the, the non-inferiority margin was defined as uh, as a 10% non-inferiority margin. The analysis is going to be in the, uh, the main analysis is going to be in the ITT population uh, using the, the FDA snapshot uh, algorithm and uh, and this is the, the, the classical, the typical uh, statistical methods. So here you have the, the flow chart. Uh, 455 patients were screened, and then finally 415, they were uh, randomized. 205 in the, in the dolutegravirus switching arm, and uh, 210, they were randomized to continue the boosted, uh, the, 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 the boosted PI. Uh, all but two patients here, they received the located medication, and all but one patient and here they received the located medication. And essentially what you can see here, there was uh, the, the discontinuation rate either because of virological failure or because of other reasons like side effects was relatively small in both arms and we will go uh, through, through that. At week 48, 190 patients, they continue on the lutegravir and uh, 198 patients, they, they continue on the boosted PI and all these patients will be eligible for a deferred switching and it will be another one year follow up. In terms of the baseline characteristics, near 80% of the patients, they had both uh, older than 50 T years and they had a Framingham score above, uh, above 10%. As uh, most were males, as expected, the CD4 counts, the average CD4 was, uh, was very high. And the, although the, the, the inclusion criteria required at least six months of undetectability, in fact, these patients had been very stable and undetectable for a median period of more than, of more than five years. Essentially, all of them has several cardiovascular risk factors, and 30% of them at the baseline, they were receiving lipid-lowering agents, and this percentage is not going to change during the study. We'll come back uh, to that uh, later on. Essentially, uh, mm, uh, the background nucleosides was uh, tenofovir FTC in 65% uh, of the patients, or bacavir 3TC in about one third of the patients, and the, the, nucle the, sorry, the, the, the boosted PI was 50% uh, uh, darunavir, then 36.5% uh, atasanavir, and then and a small proportion of other nucleosides. And here is the, the first co-primary endpoint, that is, the, 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 that is the, the efficacy. This is the ITT population, and essentially what you see is that the, the response rate of the, the patients who remained undetectable was 93% in the dolutegravir arm, 95% in the boosted PI arm, the difference was 2.1% and the lower margin or inferiority was 6.6, .6, so that the non-inferiority uh, could be uh, accepted because the, our margin uh, for this study was 10%. And essentially what you can see here is that there was a very small number of patients with a virological failure. In fact, it was 2% for patients here and 0.5% uh, that it is one patient here. And then the discontinuation for adverse events or for other reasons, there was also a relatively a small number. This is another way of showing the same data. This is a couple major plot. And here, this is a sensitivity analysis using a per protocol population. As you can see, the the graphs are almost very similar with a very high response rate and a very low uh, patients who, a very small number of patients who develop virological failure. And this results when you do a subgroup analysis, for example, stratifying by the Framingham score or stratifying by country. Again, they, they were pretty much the same. Here you have some details about the five patients who develop a virological failure. Virological failure had to be confirmed. And so, for example, in red are the four patients in the dolutegravir arm who develop virological failure. This is the first detectable viral load. This is the second, the first, the second. And here for boosted PI, this is the first of the second. As you can see here, most of this viral load was pretty low. Uh, 
two of them in the dolutegravirum, they could be amplified and no resistant mutations were detected. And the other three we tried to amplify, but they could not be, uh, they could not, could not be amplified. If we now go to the second co-primary endpoint, that is the, the lipid response, what you can see here is that both in terms of total cholesterol, non-HDL cholesterol, triglycerides, LDL cholesterol, and uh, the ratio of total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, they improved significantly. For example, for uh, LDL cholesterol, the improvement was about 8% and, the, and an improvement of 8% in the LDL cholesterol. In the general population, it, it translates in an improvement of cardiovascular risk. Uh, uh, these improvements cannot be attributed to an increased utilization of lipid lowering agents because at week 48, uh, the same uh, about the same 30% of the patients, uh, as in the baseline, were receiving lipid lowering agents in both stadiums. Uh, subgroup analysis for lipids, they show pretty much the same, uh, the, the same data so that we cannot, uh, we should not stay here. And then if we like to go to the clinical meaning of, of that, if, if you wish, here we have uh, plotted the, the number of patients prescribed or requiring lipid lowering agent. In the dolutegravir arm, uh, 10 percent, uh, uh, a reduction of 10 percent of the patients in the prescribed or requiring lipid lowering agents was detected from baseline to uh, week 48. Conversely, in the boosted, in the patients who continue with the boosted PIR, there was another 10 percent of the patients that were prescribed or requiring lipid lowering uh, agents. Uh, in terms of the changes in CD4, it was pretty similar in, in, uh, in both arms. And in terms of uh, side effects, uh, what you can see here is that if we plot uh, any adverse events, it was uh, a little bit higher in the dolutegravir arm. But when we go to grade, grade three or four adverse events, serious adverse events, adverse events related with antiretroviral therapy or discontinuation due to adverse events, the difference was not statistically significant. Uh, in particular, seven patients in the dolutegravir arm, they interrupted the study medication due to adverse events. There was one case of acute hepatitis C and six, six cases of mood and or sleep disorders. And in the boosted PI arm, it was three patients, one case of acute hepatitis C, one case of dyspepsia, and one case of a declining renal function. In terms of the estimated glomerular filtration, as you can, uh, as, <coughs> as you can see here, the introduction of dolutegravir, they mean uh, and a small reduction due to the interference in the tubular secretion of creatinine, and this is what, uh, what, uh, could, what could be expected. So, in conclusion, over 48 weeks in virologically suppressed patients with high cardiovascular risk, defined as being older than 50 years or with a Framingham score of 10%, in fact, 80% of the patients, they had both, and receiving triple therapy with a boosted PI plus two nucleosides, a switching to a dolutegravir regime was non-inferior. Sensitivity and subgroup analysis support this conclusion. Uh, it improved total cholesterol and other lipid fractions in the overall population and in most of the subgroups. There was very few episodes of virological failure. In fact, it was four and one, and no resistant mutations uh, could be detected among the two patients, the two of the five patients in whom the virus could be amplified. Overall, the tolerance was good and similar in both arms. Super studies focusing in changes of biological markers, carotid intima uh, thickness and arterial stiffness are ongoing and will be presented at the YAGS and probably at the next Amsterdam conference, and so switching to a dolutegravir regime in this kind of patient, they has the potential benefit of reducing the risk of cardiovascular risk. And so that's the most important slide. This is the trial steering committee, the endpoint review committee, the, the, the management team, and here is all the, the, the whole list of all the investigators of the 32 European sites. On behalf of them, I am presenting this study. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you, uh, Jose. Due to the time, we can allow only one burning question, please. Monsieur. Uh, Giulio Maria Corbelli, European Health Treatment Group. First, let me make a very brief personal comment. Most of the slides had a very small uh, font size, so I could not read even from the fourth row this is really something not, not very good to present some data. 
Could you have any explanation for uh, such a large margin for non-inferiority? 10% seems to well, be very, very large. Well, mo mo yeah, mo most of the switching studies, they had uh, a margin for non-inferiority of 12%, okay? Then when we designed this study that was about uh, four years ago, a uh, non-inferiority margin of 10% was usual. Then later on, if I remember well, about one year or one year and a half, uh, the FDA, they recommended that for registrational studies, the lower margin of inferiority be reduced to 4%. So that when the FDA made this recommendation, this study was almost, uh, was almost finalized and we could not change sample size. Uh, in addition of that, in addition of that, uh, I mean, this, this is the, the first switching study that is targeting not a general population, a very specific population with high cardiovascular risk. That is, uh, patients older than 50 years or patients, uh, uh, or patients who get a Framingham score above 10%. And so it's not that easy to recruit 800 or 900 patients of very high cardiovascular risk. And so that uh, uh, if you are doing general switching studies, uh, a, a low inferiority margin of 4%, Maybe, maybe right and maybe nice, but if you are doing targeted switching studies, focusing at a very specific population, it might not be that easy to do a studies with a sample size looking for a lower limit of inferiority of 4%. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, José. Uh, now, please join me to welcome uh, Laura Shafi. Um, she will present a study um, from uh, another study conducted in Cameroon and Burkina Faso, I, I think. Um, so, only one sentence for your CV. She is a HIV, she takes, she, what do you say? HIV care thing. Okay, Laura. I to introduce Laura. Laura is a friend of mine. <laughs> she's an HIV expert. She's an African HIV expert. She works in Cameroon and she's from Switzerland. It's better for me to introduce Laura like that. Okay, you can go. Merci, le moderateur. <laughs> Good afternoon uh, to everyone. And I would like to thank uh, the organizer to let us uh, present, uh, to let me present the, nom uh, the name of Moby Deep Study Group, uh, the result of the INRS 12286 Moby Deep trial, who was uh, funded and sponsored by the INRS uh, with the participation of uh, Janssen Pharmaceuticals. I have no conflict of interest. So, Moby Deep is a randomized open label superiority trial who compared uh, two maintenance strategies in virologically controlled patients in, uh, in, in West and Central Africa. The two arms that were compared was a monotherapy of boosted protease inhibitor that could be either lopinavir ritonavir twice a day or darunavir 800 boosted with ritonavir once a day. The second arm was the same boosted protease inhibitor plus lamivudine. The hypothesis that uh, brought us to this study was that even if um, monotherapy of PI shown to be an option for selected patient, there was still a risk of increased, uh, increased risk of uh, viral escape and persistent of uh, low-level replication, which is not a, a condition that is very uh, optimal in, in settings where viral load is not uh, routinely screened. Uh, so we thought that the addition of lamivudine would increase the efficacy of the strategy without additional toxicity. Notably, uh, working on the hypothesis that uh, the the uh, M184V lamivudine resistance mutation have a fitness cost for the virus and maybe protect for the emergence of other mutation. So uh, the, um, the study started and at week 48, the DSMB asked for an interim analysis and advised to uh, interrupt the monotherapy arm. So we presented and we published the result at 48 weeks where the superiority of dual therapy was very well shown and we continue uh, the treatment of, uh, of patients on dual therapy if they agreed until they the expected endpoint of 96 weeks. And these are the results I'm going to present. 
So the study is a multi-center study run in Cameroon, Senegal, and Burkina Faso. And we took advantage of the post-trial um, post phase of the two lady study comparing three different strategies of VI, where patients were randomized one by one and stratified by site and uh, uh, viral load to either uh, to continue only the boosted PI or to continue with the boosted PI plus the addition of uh, lamivudin. So the patients were eligible if they had a viral load below 200 copies for at least six months, had not changed in art in the last three months, and they, if they had a CD4 count above 100 and adherence above 90% in the last control, and of course if they signed informed consent. They were excluded if they were a chronic carrier of hepatitis B, had a previous failure on second line, or sign and sign of HIV encephalitis, and if they were stable, uh, unstable clinically or pregnant or lactating. So the primary outcome of the study was the proportion of patients with uh, treatment failure at uh, 96 weeks, and the treatment failure was defined for viral load above 500 copy at two consecutive sample uh, in at least one month of uh, delay uh, in which we did the adherent support. And the other definition was the reintroduction of uh, the backbone or the interruption of PI for any other reason. The primary endpoint was analyzed in intention to treat. Sorry. We had, of course, a secondary outcome. Um, looking at immunological, clinical uh, um, endpoint, uh, um, drug discontinuation for, uh, in the, uh, for a clinical event and uh, changes in biological parameter and adherence. So now we, I present the baseline characteristic of the dual therapy arm. We see that it is a cohort mainly of women, as is uh, frequent in African court. The median age was 43 years, and they were patients with a, a, an history, a median duration of antiretroviral of around seven years. They were quite immunodepressed at initiation of antiretrovirals, with 50% being in stage 3 or 4 of WHO classification, and with another CD4 for 50% of them below 100. With the, even at the switch to second line, uh, we had a median CD4 of below 200, uh, while at the inclusion in Moby Deep, the CD4 median was uh, above 400, 472 cells. Um, at the moment of inclusion, 83% of them had the viral load below 50 copy. They had uh, around three years on second line, and 97% of them had the M184V uh, mutation. 33% of them were on Darunavir. So we screened patients of two ladies, and we included a randomized 265, but the one allocated to boosted PI plus lamivudine were 132, which that are the one that we analyze. So if we come at the primary outcome, we see that in total we had, we had 11 treatment failure with eight virological failure and three that failed for other causes. There was one death and two loss to follow up. So we can um, uh, say that there was a virological success of 94%, a treatment success of 91.7%. So the, the media viral load at failure was uh, 14,000 copies. So in, if you look at secondary outcomes and we look at the population at week 96 uh, below 50 copies, we see that uh, we have a result of 79%, which is quite stable compared to the beginning of the study, while 91% have a viral load below 200 copies. Concerning immunological recovery, there was a, an increase from baseline of 62 uh, cells with the median CD4 at the end of the study above 500 uh, cells. Clinical um, and uh, 
clinical outcome uh, were quite uh, good also. There uh, was one lead not related to study drug, was a complication of a gastric cancer surgery. We have three event defining, uh, eight defining event, mostly skin condition, and uh, 22 uh, severe adverse event, mostly hospitalization for infectious diseases, uh, malaria, and so on. And uh, we had uh, 336 uh, events of any grade uh, occurring in at least 5% of patients. And you see the frequency of this, uh, the, the distribution of this uh, outcome that are mainly general disorder, respiratory uh, disorder, and uh, blood and lymphatic disorder. Concerning tolerance, we didn't observe the expected improvement in renal function with a, a non-significant change from baseline of glomerular filtration rate, as well as in the lipid profile, there were no significant changes from baseline to week 96. Uh, in the meantime, it was a population with uh, not an ideal adherence, as uh, when adherence was measured by questionnaire, only 23% had uh, always, um, between inclusion and week 96, adherence above 95%, while at pill count was a little bit better with 67%, which is not in any case the ideal adherence. We manage, uh, we analyzed the virological failure, the eight virological failure, seven had been genotyped, and we remarked that none develop resistance to PI or uh, NRTI new resistance. Two had lost the 184 mutation, and there were two patients who had both viral uh, load um, above 100,000 copies, which we suspect also of uh, adherence problem. Five uh, of eight participants had uh, tenophory uh, reintroduced, four resurpressed, and for one, as it was at the end of the study, we don't have the data. And three patients for which clinicians identified the adherent problem were not changed and were any, in any case resurpressed at the uh, following visit. So if we can conclude that uh, our result at 96 weeks confirm the success rate of uh, these maintenance strategies with PI, boosted PI plus lamivudine in uh, stable uh, second line patient, despite an history of the presence of 184 mutation, and that uh, this strategy uh, do not uh, cause loss of future option as there were no new resistance developed. I would like to acknowledge participants and health authorities of, uh, of the country where the study was done and all the investigators and the steering committee and the oversight committees that helped us to realize it. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, any burning, one burning question, please. Uh, hello. Hey, so, one, one, actually two questions. Uh, I, say one, I say one. All right. <laughs> The first one would have been, why didn't you inc include a control arm? But you can choose which one to answer. Uh, the second one would be, it's important to remember this is a switch study, but really the, important, you know, the, the key question is whether you could use this uh, 3TC plus a boosted PI as uh, you know, initial therapy and second line. What, what, do you, what do you think about that? So for the control arm is true is the, the critic that we always have. We try to do some simulation with the two lady study that was uh, on, uh, remain on second line with the same characteristics and we had a very similar result at 48 weeks. But it's true we don't have the control arm. Uh, at, uh, at using these strategies uh, as, uh, as first line, uh, I'm, I cannot answer like this. I think that it may be more interesting in this combination to keep it for second line because we think that the 184 mutation has its role in the success of this uh, treatment and so in naive patient we, not, we may not have this advantage as uh, monotherapy as I said uh, at the beginning uh, if uh, in, in first line is not really advised. Thank you Laura.
You may discuss after the session, please, with Laura for the first line or the second line. You can discuss after with uh, Monsieur after the session. Thank you. Okay, the floor is now to my co-chair, Monica Gandhi. Okay, so um, I wanted to introduce Dr. Kathleen Squires. I can't introduce in French, but, um, and also a friend of mine, uh, Chief of the Division of Infectious Disease at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She presented the results of the Drive Forward trial um, at CROI and now is going to tell us the results of the Phase three Drive Ahead study, which is the fixed dose combination of Duravarine, Lamivudine, and TDF is non-inferior to Favarin's Emtricitabine TDF in treatment naive patients with HIV. Thank you, Monica. Good afternoon. <clears throat> On the behalf of the study team, I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to present the results of the Drive Ahead study. And first and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge all the participants who uh, were in the study, as well as the uh, investigators and their staff, and all the efforts that they contributed towards the study. These are my current disclosures, but I need to update them by letting you know that as of mid-August, I will be transitioning from my current position at Thomas Jefferson University to step into uh, the position of Dr. Sandra Lerman upon her retirement. Okay, so in terms of background, Duravarine is a novel next-generation non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. It has a unique resistance profile with in vitro activity against wild type HIV-1 and the most prevalent NNRTI resistance mutations listed on this slide. It is dosed once daily without regard to food, and it has a low potential for drug-drug interactions, including with acid-reducing agents. It is being developed as a single entity and in a fixed-dose combination with lamivudine and tenofovir disaproxyl fumarate. In a phase 2B uh, clinical trial, deravirine at 100 milligrams demonstrated favorable efficacy and a superior neuropsychiatric profile versus efavirenz at the standard dose of 600 milligrams daily. In the phase 3 drive forward clinical trial, deravirine again at 100 milligrams showed non inferior efficacy to ritonavir boosted darinavir and a more favorable lipid profile. So now to drive ahead. This is a phase three multi-center double-blind uh, randomized study in treatment naive patients. In terms of entry criteria, patients had to have a viral load of at least a, a thousand copies, antiretroviral anti naive, and no evidence to resistance to any of the stu uh, study drugs on genotypic testing, and for stratification factors for HIV RNA of greater than or less than 100,000, and um, the status by chronic uh, B or C infections. Patient were, patients were randomized to the co-formulation of deravirine, 3TC, and tenofovir, or placebo, or to efavirenz, FTC, um, tenofovir, and placebo. Um, in terms of, of the instructions to the patients, they were told to take either the efavirenz active or placebo pill at bedtime on an, or in the evening on an empty stomach, and the deravirine active or placebo pill at any point during the day uh, without regard to food. I am going to be presenting to you the primary um, analysis time point at 48 weeks. Here are the primary efficacy and safety hypotheses. The primary e efficacy hypothesis is that, and I'm going to say now deravirine or um, efavirenz for the rest of the presentation, that deravirine is non-inferior to efavirenz as assessed by the proportion of patients with HIV RNA less than 50 copies at week 48. Um, it would be considered to be non-inferior if the lower bound of the two-sided 95% uh, 95, 95 confidence interval for between treatment differences is greater than negative 10 percentage points. There's 90% power with 340 participants in each treatment group, assuming a response rate of 80% at 48 weeks. The primary safety hypothesis is that deravirine is superior to efavirenz as assessed by the proportion of patient, uh, participants with neuropsychiatric adverse events by week 48 in the categories of dizziness, sleep disorders and disturbances, and altered sensorium. And the secondary safety hypothesis is that deravirine is superior to efavirenz assessed, as assessed by the mean change from baseline in LDL cholesterol and non-HDL cholesterol at week 48. 
On this slide is the disposition at week 48. You can see that 734 patients were randomized into the study, and an equal number 364 in both treatment arms received study drugs. At 48 weeks, 86% 80, of patients continued in the study on the deraverine arm versus 83% in the efavirenz arm. When you look at the reasons for discontinuation, you can see that they're similar across the two treatment arms, except that there is a higher off um, discontinu discontinuation rate for adverse events, and I will be discussing those um, in subsequent slides. In terms of the baseline characteristics, the median baseline age was about 31 years of age. About 85% of the patients were male, and just about 50% of the patients were white. About 14% of the patients had a clinical history of, H of AIDS, uh, and about 65, 66% of the patients had clade B virus. In terms of the baseline um, HIV RNA, it was about 4.5 logs. And in terms of the baseline CD4 cell count, it's about 420. Um, and there were 12% and 13%, uh, respectively, of participants who had CD4 cell counts at two, excuse me, 200 or below. All right, now turning to the virologic results. Here you see the proportion of participants with HIV RNA less than 50 copies per mil. At week 48, that was 84% of patients in the deraverine arm versus 81% of patients. In the efavirenz arm, you can see the difference of 3.5 in the 95% confidence intervals, which leads to a conclusion that deraverine is non-inferior to efavirenz. And here now, looking at virologic outcomes, um, you can see uh, on the bar graph to your left the same results that I just presented to you in terms of the percentage of patients less than 50 copies. For patients at week 48 who ate HIV RNA of 50 copies or above, you see 11 um, percent in the uh, deraverine arm and 10 percent in the efavirenz arm. And then in terms of uh, no data in the window, 5 percent in the deraverine arm and 9 percent in the efavirenz arm. Now turning to look at efficacy by subgroup, by the observed failure approach, and specifically looking at baseline viral load and baseline CD4 cell counts, uh, examining first baseline viral loads, you can see that regardless of baseline viral load, there were very similar proportions of patients across both arms of this trial who achieved less than 50 copies per mil. In terms of uh, baseline CD4 cell count, in the greater than 200 strata, there were very high rates of patients and similar across both arms who achieved uh, viral loads less than 50 copies per mil. In the less than 200, you can see that there are modest numbers of patients, which really lead to the wide confidence interval here, but you note that the confidence, confidence interval does, in fact, cross zero. Now looking at CD4 cell counts, you can see that there were robust increases in CD4 cell counts across both arms of the trial. 198 uh, CD4 cells in the uh, deraverine arm and 188 cells in the efavirenz arm. Now looking at resistance, if you look uh, at week 48, if you look across the first row here, you can see that this, um, these are participants who had defined, protocol-defined virologic failure, which, as you note at the bottom of the slide, is a confirmed viral load of 50 copies or greater after an initial response to less than 50 copies per mil, or a confirmed HIV RNA of 200 copies or greater at week 24 or week 36, or a confirmed viral load of 50 copies or greater at week 48. So um, for the first row, you can see that uh, that was 22 patients in the deraverine arm and 14 patients in the efavirenz arm. And those are broken down into non-responders and rebounders, which are 6 and 16 and 4 and 10, respectively. The second row looks at participants who discontinued um, at any time throughout the 40 week, 48 weeks of the study and had a detectable viral load. You can see that's 35 in the deraverine arm and 50 in the efavirenz arm. For any patient whose sample had a viral load of at least 400 copies per mil, genotype um, testing was uh, tempted. And as you can see, uh, that was successfully performed in 23 samples in the deraverine arm and in uh, 24 samples in the efavirenz arm. Directing your attention to the deraverine arm, six patients or 1.6 of all of the patients in the study on deraverine, 364, 
had virus that exhibited primary NNRTI resistance, and five patients, or 1.4%, had virus that exhibited primary NRTI resistance. In the efavirenz arm, that was 12 and 3.3 and 5 and 1.4, and you can see the resistance mutations uh, that emerged uh, across both arms of the study at the bottom of the slide. Now turning to safety analyses, this is a summary of clinical adverse events. You can see that the majority of patients in the study did um, report one or more adverse events. If you look at drug-related adverse events, you can see that a higher proportion of patients randomized to efavirenz reported or experienced adverse events as compared to deraverine. And specifically, when you look at discontinuation due to adverse events, you can see that a higher proportion of patients randomized to efavirenz discontinued due to um, adverse events uh, versus patients um, on the deraverine arm, and that most of these were drug-related. Now looking at most common adverse events, which occurred in at least 10% of patients on each treatment arm, uh, these are the most common adverse events, and I'd like to direct your attention to dizziness, abnormal dreams, and rash, in which you see that patients randomized to efavirenz reported these side effects, or these adverse events, excuse me, more commonly than patients who were randomized to the deraverine arm. Now, specifically in terms of the first safety um, uh, analysis or uh, hypothesis that I refer to, um, in this pre-specified analysis looking at five uh, neuropsychiatric adverse of interest, the uh, analysis here was to look at the proportion of patients who experienced these events in uh, the deraverine arm compared to the efavirenz arm. And as you can see for the first three of these, for dizziness, sleep disorders, and disturbances, and for altered sensorium, a statistically significant greater proportion of patients reported these adverse or neuropsychiatric adverse events in the efavirenz arm as compared to the deraverine arm. And then you see the other two categories, depression and suicide or self-injury, psychosis and psychotic disorders occurring with much less frequency across both arms of the study. Now moving to laboratory outcomes, uh, specifically grade three or four laboratory changes. I'm going to deal with fasting um, or with serum lipids in just a moment. In terms of the other uh, outcomes, uh, chain, laboratory changes on this slide, you can see that these occurred in um, a low proportion or percentage of patients across both arms of the trial, and there was really no discernible pattern to these uh, changes. Now, specifically talking about fasting lipids and the second um, safety hypothesis that I reviewed with you, um, the two uh, pre-specified lipid parameters of interest were LDL uh, cholesterol and non-HDL cholesterol, uh, looking at the proportion of patients who experienced changes in these parameters. And as you can see for them, there was a statistically significant difference in favor of deraverine. There were elevations in both of these parameters in the um, efavirenz arm as opposed to slight declines in these parameters um, in the deraverine arm. In fact, across all of these parameters, you did see uh, elevations with efavirenz and um, uh, small to modest declines in uh, the deraverine arm. For HDL cholesterol, you saw rises um, in both arms um, a little bit higher, uh, higher I should say, in um, the efavirenz arm. So in terms of the drive-ahead study, in treatment-naive adults with HIV-1 infection, the co-formulation of deraverine, 3TC, and tenofovir administered once daily demonstrated antiviral potency with non-inferior efficacy to efavirenz, uh, FTC, and um, tenofovir regardless of baseline HIV RNA and a low rate of resistance, with only 1.6% of participants developing resistance to any study drug through week 48. Deraverine, 3TC, and tenofovir were generally well tolerated um, and safe. The neuropsychiatric profile was uh, superior to efavirenz, emtricitabine, and tenofovir as measured by lower proportion of participants with neuropsychiatric AEs in the categories of dizziness, sleep disorders, and disturbances in altered sensorium. And the lipid profile was superior to efavirenz, emtricitabine, and tenofovir as assessed by differences from baseline in fasting LDL cholesterol and non-HDL cholesterol. So in conclusion, deraverine is a novel once-daily NNRTI for first-line treatment with consistent efficacy regardless of baseline viral load and favorable tolerability and safety profile in the 
two phase three clinical trials. And thank you for your attention. Any questions for Dr. Squires? Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Laura Waters from London, UK. You said that the efficacy is consistent regardless of baseline viral load. And although I appreciate that between arms, the response divided by baseline viral load was similar, there was quite a large numerical drop off in both arms of about 10%. For Did you a look at the statistical difference within arms by baseline viral load? Yeah, so there was a 10% difference, correct, that were consistent across the arms, and I do not know if that was statistically significant. Number four. Um, Christina? Christina? Yes, Sorry. please, number four. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kathleen, for this data important. Just wondering, the, the resistance rate at failure was low, but could you tell us how many patients lost the class of an NLTI, or was it a rescue for a drug how, like Getravirin or so on? How many patients, I'm sorry, what? Lost the class, the use of the class, because you listed the mutation, but we don't know how many patients were completely resistant to the class of an NLTI. Uh, so, that's, um, I can't recall that off the top of my head, but I can certainly get back to you on that. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I just can't. No, it's no, no, no. Not in there at the moment, but. I will wait. Okay. <laughs> and I will Question. get it to you. <laughs> I'm number five over here. Hey, uh, Andrew Carr from Sydney. I suppose if, if I was being optimistic, if I saw regimens that were equally potent and one was better tolerated than the other, that, that might translate into a snapshot analysis difference. So when you show the difference in tolerability, particularly for neuropsych, that's over the 48 weeks, but is that difference still apparent at week 48, or does it, is it only really apparent at weeks two and four, and then the drugs are equally well tolerated for, from a CNS perspective? Again, I can't tell you that specifically. I believe the analysis was done over the 48 weeks of the study. I don't believe an analysis was done by t breaking down by time period. Again, I can find that out and get back to you. Thanks. Okay, last question, number four. Thank you, Ulrich Kastenbauer from Munich. Um, even though it was not statistically significant, could you comment a bit further on the um, lower rate of virologic success in the further advanced um, patients? Well, I think that's something that we have certainly seen in other studies. Um, in, and fortunately, in many of the more recent uh, trials that we have, phase three trials across all of our newer agents, we have relatively modest proportions of patients who come into the trial with greater than 100,000 copies. So I don't think that the data is as robust, but uh, I'm, I'm- I'm referring to the CD4 count. Oh, the CD, I'm so sorry. CD4 cell count. Yeah, so first and foremost, the, as you know, there were relatively modest proportions of patients. And while it did look like it favored efavirenz, if you recall in the drive forward study where deraverin was compared to darunavir ritonavir, we did, we did see this, these wide confidence intervals, but in fact, in that study, it favored deraverin over the boosted protease inhibitor. So I don't, I don't necessarily think there's a signal there, but again, there are very modest proportions of patients. And Kate, do you know if this fixed dose combination is anticipated to be available? Will TAF be included with uh, Duravarine or it's going to be with TDF? Uh, my understanding is that it's going to be with Tenofovir. Okay. So Thank you very much. Thank you. And then the next presenter is Michael Abad, who's the global uh, medical lead for Dolotegravir. Um, at V Pharmacy uh, Healthcare, and he was an HIV specialist in the UK before that. He's going to speak on the superior efficacy of dolotegravir plus two NRTIs compared with lopinavir ritonavir, plus two NRTIs in second line treatment, the Donning study. Good afternoon, and thank you to the organizers for accepting this abstract. On behalf of the Dawning study team and investigators, I'm happy to be presenting this interim analysis today at week 24. So I think we'll all agree that there continues to be a need to optimize second-line therapy in research-limited setting. The study, the, the Dawning study, was set up to investigate the efficacy and safety of dolotegravir plus two nucleosides, 
versus boosted lupinavir plus two nucleosides in, in the setting of first-line virologic failure in resource-limited setting. The, NITR, the NRTI regimen in the background was investigator selected, but genotype testing was employed to achieve at least one active nucleoside in, in the background. So the dawning study is an open-label randomized non-inferiority study. Subjects failing virologically on a non-nucleoside regimen were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either receive dolutegravir plus two nucleosides or boosted lopinavir plus two nucleosides. The primary endpoint is at week 48, and it's a snapshot efficacy endpoint for viral load less than 50. Today I'll be presenting an interim analysis at week 24. So subjects had to be failing virologically on a non-nucleoside regimen with a viral load above 400, and they needed to have been on therapy for at least six months. There should be no primary integrase or protease mutations. Stratification was by viral load above and below 100,000, and the number of active nucleoside in the background, two versus less than two. The study was powered for a 12% non-inferiority margin. So the dawning IDMC had three planned analysis through the life of the study. After the second plan analysis, the panel observed a difference in response between the arms in favor of the Dolotegva regimen. Because of this, they conducted an ad hoc analysis ahead of the final planned analysis. At this time, they observed that this delta between the arms in favor of Dolotegva was maintained, but that it was increasingly being driven by protocol-defined virologic non-success. They therefore concluded that this difference is clinically important and recommended that the boosted lopinavir arm of the study be prematurely terminated before the primary endpoint. The study protocol was subsequently modified, allowing subjects on the boosted lopinavir arm to access dolutegravir. So here you see the global uh, enrollment uh, in keeping with the footprint of the global ec epidemic. So at the time of the week 24 analysis, here you see the study disposition, about 50% or so of subjects had gotten to their primary endpoint at week 48. And in the tables below, you see the main reasons for premature discontinuation from the study, ranging from adverse events all the way to protocol violations and withdrawal of consent. So at baseline, the median age was 37 and more than a third of patients in this study were female. 40% or so were of African heritage. Hepatitis B and C co-infection rates were low. About a third of patients or so fit met CDC category C classification. 20% had a viral load above 100,000, and a good half of patients in both arms had a CD4 count less than 200. All of this really saying that a significant proportion of patients were recruited into this study with advanced disease. Um, the median duration in previous therapy was about three years, and as you can see, 80% or so of subjects came from an effavirance regimen, and tenofovir was in the background regimen in about 60% of subjects, and AZT in about 30%. So post-randomization, this is what uh, subjects ended up with in the background regimen. Uh, an equal proportion, about 40% in each case, ended up on AZT plus 3TC or tenofovir plus either 3TC or FTC. So let's move straight on to the, primary, uh, to the end point at week 24. So what you see here is the intention to treat analysis in the solid bars and the per-protocol analysis in the shaded bars. So looking at the intention to treat exposed analysis, you see efficacy rates of 82% in the dolotegravir arm and 69% in the boosted lopinavir arm. This delta between the arm is consistent with what is seen in the per-protocol analysis, again 86% versus 72% in favor of dolotegravir. Now as you look to the right of this slide, you see the forest plot showing the adjusted difference between arms. So in the intention to treat analysis, you see an adjusted difference of 13.8, and in the per-protocol analysis, a difference of 14.5. And in both of these sensitivity analysis, you see that the lower limit of the confidence interval is way to the right of the zero mark in a positive direction, indicating that in this study, not only is dolutegravir plus two nucleosides non-inferior to boosted lopinavir plus two nucleosides, but actually it was statistically superior. So what was driving this superior efficacy on the dolotegravir arm? Um, 
So here, if we look at the snapshot outcomes table, again, we see the virologic response rates of 82% versus 69% in the intention to treat analysis. But then as you look at the further two categories below this, you try and tease out the differences that, that make a difference. So looking at the virologic non-response category, you see that this was the major driver of the difference between the arms. 12% for dolotegvir and 25% for boosted lopinavir were virologic non-response. And as you look at the granularity uh, within this, you see that the category of data and window not less than 50 was the biggest driver of virologic non-response. So these were subjects who were viremic at the tw week 24 uh, window. In the category below, no virologic data, this is a category that looks at discontinuations due to adverse events and other reasons like loss to follow-up, uh, protocol violations, etc. And again within this, you see a notable difference between arms in the category of discontinuations due to adverse events of death. So 1% in the dolotegvir arm and 4% for boosted lupinavir. So really what the snapshot table is showing us is, is that this superior efficacy and the delta between the arms is driven predominantly for reasons of virologic non-response in favor of dolotegvir and for a smaller uh, proportion for safety reasons. So is this delta between the arms, the superiority finding consistent uh, depending on relevant background ba baseline uh, variables that, that impact outcomes in clinical trials? And the answer is clearly yes. As you can see, the, delta, the, the outcomes is in favor of dolotegra regardless of viral load strata, CD4 strata, strata or the, the number of active nukes in the background. So while during the week 24 analysis, we had access to large proportions of data from weeks 36 and weeks 48, and we thought we'll do the analysis and see if this delta observed between the arms at week 24 is actually consistent across time. So as you can see, the delta is indeed consistent. You see a delta of 15.4% in a substantial, substantial proportion of patients through weeks 48. Um, but importantly, as we looked at the details within this, it was obvious that this delta was increasingly being driven by virologic non-response reasons. And on this slide, you see details that explain this. So these are subjects who met criteria for confirmed virologic withdrawal from the study. So these are true virologic non-responses. So if you look on the dolotegvir arm, you see that the number of CVWs through, times, through time increased from one at week 16 to six, to six subjects at week 24 and 10 at any time, any time meaning up to the time we did this interim analysis. And if you look on the boosted lopinavir arm, you see the number increasing from one to 18 to 28. So what was the cost of virologic failure in this study? Um, so as you can see, eight subjects in the dolotegvir arm met criteria for CVW and had an amplifiable genotype. And this number in the boosted lopinavir arm was 24. So no subjects in either arm of the study failed with a primary PI or integrase mutation. But importantly, we see three subjects in the boosted lopinavir arm failing with a total of five new emergent nucleoside mutations. There were no new emergent nucleoside mutations on the dolotegvir arm. So looking at overall safety profile, we see that as you look at the relevant uh, safety comparisons, there are a lot more adverse events reported in, in the boosted lopinavir arm than in the dolotegvir arm, as is to be expected. Specifically, looking at those adverse events occurring in the highest frequencies, you see that the difference between the arms is driven, as is to be expected, by gastrointestinal adverse events. Uh, I, I could draw your attention to nausea, for example, because that seems to be topical. Um, uh, Drug-related adverse events occurred in uh, much, less, much less frequency in the dolotegvir arm. As you look into more details on those adverse events that are most important, uh, you, for example, drug-related adverse events with a higher grading, etc., you see much less reported in the dolotegvir arm. Um, only 2% of subjects discontinued because of an adverse event in the dolotegvir arm compared to 5% in the boosted lopinavir arm. Now, it's important to note that CNS adverse events were reported in a relatively low rate in the study, and the rates are roughly equal between the arms. No subject discontinued because of a CNS adverse event. So in conclusion, week 24 data from the Dawning study showed that dolotegvir plus 2 nucleoside was statistically superior to boosted lopinavir plus 2 nucleoside in, in first-line virologic failure. This 
superior efficacy was driven predominantly by reasons of virologic non-success in favor of the dolutegra arm. The, the safety profile of dolutegra plus two nucleoside was favorable compared to the control arm, and importantly, there were no new treatment emergent integrase or nucleoside mutations on the dolutegra arm. So this study provides important data that will guide the robust and optimal management of second-line therapy in resource-limited setting. I'd like to conclude by thanking all those who made this study a success, the participants and their families and loved ones, the GSK and Vive invest, uh, study, study uh, teams, our clinical investigators and their staff, and importantly, I'd like to take a moment to thank the IDMC panel within the, the Dawning study for the professional manner in which they handle data from this study. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll start with a question over here and um, this side, please. This is number four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bart Hender, sort of them. I was wondering if you have on the, on the top of your head the response rate in patients without any active NRTI? I do not yet. I mean, a, a, a more detailed analysis of outcomes by baseline resistance mutation patterns uh, will, be, will be the subject of a future presentation. And then um, number three, please. Five, yeah. Kim, this, was, this was my question, because uh, either if uh, the choice of NRTI backbone was well balanced, knowing the uh, mutation profile and whether this uh, had a role in the outcome will be very important. I completely agree, Dr. Rafi. So that will be the uh, subject of a future presentation. And then on the side here, please. Practically the same as the other two. Um, I'd like to know a bit more about the, the people who failed the screening. I think there was, I wrote it down, 968 and you actually enrolled 624. Were a lot of those um, screening failures because of NRTI resistance? Because obviously the big question is can we do this without genotyping? Absolutely. Thank you for, for that question, Polly. It, it's, it's, it's really an important question because we did um, uh, use resistance testing in the study and acknowledge that this is not necessarily widespread, wide, widely used in resource limited setting. Um, so while these data are not QC'd properly yet, Polly, I do have some information and the, so the proportion of um, screen failures that, that were for resistance reasoning were about 30% of all screen failures, but more importantly, the pro that proportion in terms of everybody screened for the study was quite low and it was in the region of roughly 7 to 8%. We need to QC that data, but if they were correct, I think it means that it increases the applicability of these data to the region. Okay, last question, sorry, number six. Niels Postel from Munich, Germany. Um, it's well known that with uh, protease inhibitors, there are um, more often low-level viremia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have data on a cutoff, for example, 200 in terms of viral load? We have, not done that, we have not done that analysis yet, but we could do in the future. I think what's important to note here is that even though we use a stricter criteria of less than 200, the re this exact question is the reason I showed you outcomes through time all the way to the most recent cuts through weeks 48 and the driver for the delta within this. And it's clear that the driver was virologic non-response, specifically confirmed virologic withdrawal. So I think uh, we can say with certainty that the driver was true virologic non-response. Michael, did you have any markers of adherence at all, like self-report? We did utilize one measure of adherence, but I don't have the, uh, the assessment from that yet. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. And then our last presentation uh, for this session is Dr. Trevor Crowell, who's a physician consultant for the data analysis and clinical research liaison for West Africa, the US military HIV research program and assistant professor at Uniform Services University. And he'll present on HIV-specific broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibody, VRCO1, and its impact on patients who were started in the setting of acute HIV infection on ARV and then um, interrupted. Great, thank you very much for the opportunity to present these data uh, from the RV397 trial of VRCO1 therapy in participants who initiated ART during acute HIV infection. I'm happy to present these data on behalf of my co-authors, as well as the RV397 and RV254 study teams. For reasons that have been previously described, 
individuals who initiate antiretroviral therapy during acute HIV infection are excellent candidates for the testing of novel therapies designed to achieve HIV remission. VRC01 is one such therapy. Its antiviral efficacy has been well described. It is a monoclonal antibody that targets the CD4 binding site. Uh, when given to participants with chronic, otherwise untreated HIV infection, VRC01 decreases plasma viremia. When given to participants who initiated ART during the chronic phase of infection, VRC01 infusions delay time to rebound uh, as compared to historic controls. For these reasons, we undertook a randomized placebo-controlled th trial of VRC01 monotherapy in individuals who initiated ART during acute HIV infection. We hypothesized that participants receiving VRC01 would have a higher rate of viral suppression at 20, 24 weeks following analytic treatment interruption as compared to participants receiving placebo. The primary objectives of this study included evaluation of the safety of VRC01 and also evaluation of its ability as monotherapy to maintain virologic suppression at 24 weeks after ART suppression, uh, uh, ART interruption. Secondary objectives included evaluation of the impact of VRC01 on viral dynamics, HIV reservoirs, and other endpoints. This study aimed to enroll 24 adult volunteers at the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center in Bangkok, Thailand, using the RV254 cohort as a source population. Uh, adults uh, were required to have started ART during, anti, uh, during FIBIC stages one through three of acute HIV infection and had to be well suppressed on ART for a period of at least two years prior to study entry. On the day of a participant's first study infusion, antiretroviral therapy was stopped and the period of analytic treatment interruption began. Participants were randomized in a three to one ratio, stratified by FIBIG stage, to receive either VRC01 or placebo intravenously every three weeks for up to 24 weeks. At study week 24, the study's primary endpoint was assessed. This was virologic control with a viral load less than 50 copies per milliliter. Participants who satisfied this endpoint were then observed off all therapies for up to another 24 weeks. Throughout the study period, participants were monitored very closely for HIV viremia and for other indications for ART resumption. The protocol stated that ART would be resumed for any of the criteria listed here. In actuality, every participant who reinitiated ART did so for the first reason listed, a confirmed viral load above 1,000 copies per milliliter, defined by two separate assessments at least one day apart. The study aimed to enroll 24 participants, but enrollment was terminated early because of difficulties importing the study product into Thailand uh, that emerged after the study began. Enrollment was halted, and the four participants who had enrolled but had not yet received their first infusion were withdrawn from the study. Nineteen participants were randomized, and of these, one participant in the VRC01 arm experienced severe generalized urticaria during the first study infusion. The infusion was not completed, and this participant did not undergo treatment interruption. Eighteen participants did undergo treatment interruption. These all were Thai male volunteers, and their characteristics are summarized here. Serial uh, VRC01 serum levels uh, during the infusion phase of the study are presented here. And you can see that throughout this phase of the study, VRC01 levels were well above the target trough of 50 micrograms per milliliter. This was even true in participants who experienced viral rebound during the infusion phase of the study. There was one serious adverse event in the study, which was the severe generalized urticaria uh, already mentioned. Most other events were mild, and there were no differences in the prevalence of adverse events between the two study groups. There were no hospitalizations, no cases of acute retroviral syndrome, and no participant developed new drug resistance mutations. All participants were tested for anti-VRC01 antibodies at multiple time points throughout the study, including at the time of ART resumption, and no such antibodies were found. Once participants reinitiated antiretroviral therapy, 
all resuppressed within five weeks, and many participants resuppressed uh, considerably faster than that. This figure here shows serial viral load assessments for the 18 participants who underwent treatment interruption. The participants in the VRC01 arm are represented by the black lines, and the red, uh, red line uh, represents those in the placebo arm. You can see that at two weeks, many participants in the placebo arm already have detectable viremia, and there is a moderate trend towards delayed rebound viremia in the VRC01 group. One participant, participant 9, had sustained virologic suppression at 42 weeks in the study. This participant was a 24-year-old, is a 24-year-old man who has sex with men, who initiated antiretroviral therapy during FEBIG stage 3 of acute HIV infection and had been well suppressed for over three years prior to entry into RV397. You can see here his viral load assessments, uh, both from the time of acute HIV infection through his participation in RV254 in black, uh, and then more recently through his participation in RV397 in blue. I can update this slide uh, to tell you that over the weekend, the participant had their first detectable viral load. On Saturday, their viral load was 58. Yesterday, it was 105. And another assessment is planned for tomorrow. Previously, this participant had undergone additional testing with the ultra-sensitive uh, single-copy HIV RNA assay and had low-grade detectable viremia up to a maximum of 1.5 copies per milliliter that at that time did not progress to clinically detectable viral rebound. This participant has also had total HIV DNA assessed at multiple time points prior to entry into RV397 and it was in the range of 5 to 79 copies per 10 to the 6th CD4 cells. Throughout this participant's receipt of VRC01 infusions, the serum concentration of VRC01 was well above the target trough level. Overall, we see that VRC01 is associated with a trend toward delayed time to viral rebound, and that is portrayed here using two different thresholds for, for the definition of viral rebound. On the left-hand side, we see a Kaplan-Meier curve for time to HIV RNA above 20 copies per milliliter, representing the lower limit of detection for the clinical assay. And you see that participants in the placebo group experienced their first detectable viral load at a median of 14 days after treatment interruption, whereas in the VRC01 group, the first detectable viral load occurred at a median of 26 days. On the right-hand side of the slide, we use a higher threshold of 1,000 copies per milliliter, and here you see a statistically significant delay in time to viral rebound in the VRC01 group. Viral rebound was associated with a small but statistically significant increase in total HIV DNA in the placebo group, but not in the VRC01 group. In both groups, the overall frequency of infected cells was actually quite low as compared to participants who initiated uh, ART during the chronic phase of HIV infection. There's also a, a statistically significant uh, uh, but not strong association between baseline HIV DNA at the time of treatment interruption uh, and days until viral rebound. In this small experience, VRC01 was generally safe and well tolerated when administered during an intensely monitored period of ART interruption. This randomized study showed a trend toward delayed virologic rebound with VRC01 administration given to participants who initiated ART during acute HIV infection. However, VRC01 monotherapy was insufficient to maintain viral suppression. Mechanisms underlying breakthrough viremia require further investigation. The efficacy signal in this study gives us hope that combination therapies, particularly those employing the newest, strongest, and broadest monoclonal antibodies may have more efficacy, uh, and these combination therapies need to be tested. Further research is also needed to investigate uh, factors that are associated 
with time to rebound viremia and factors that contributed to the delay in rebound viremia demonstrated by participants who received VRCO1 in this study. I'd like to thank the very dedicated and very engaged volunteers who participated in this study uh, and the extensive team of investigators who made this work possible. Thank you for your attention. I think people are um, at the end of the session <laughs> internally, so um, it is four o'clock, so thank you very much. I think no questions for Dr. Kroll. Thank you.